Uh, let's kick off way out there deep in Asia, uh, as far as you can go, I think, really, to Sydney, Australia, with Peter Maguire, CEO of XM Australia. The markets have opened this morning, Peter, a little bit up, nearly 1% up on Brent. Uh, yes. After the wobble last month, we've had a pretty strong recovery, and now it seems the markets have plateaued a little bit, again, back in this low 70 point. Uh, where do you think the dynamics are at the moment? Well, good morning, Sean. Good morning, uh, everyone. I think first off, it's had such a massive move in the last, you know, six to 10 trading days, Sean. It really took everyone, I think, by surprise. Huge uptick, probably up the best part of 11 odd percent. So uh, possibly it's exhausted. It's not unusual to see after a big dramatic move like that. It was oversold and then it was possibly to the point of overbought. So it's a little bit of consolidation. Uh, big demand that isn't going away. That, that numbers coming out of certainly Eurozone and US. So it's been a very strong summer period for cons consumption. And the storyline is probably every producer is rubbing their hands with glee. And maybe there's another dollar or two in it to the upside in the short term. Let's go to Singapore. Vandana Hari, founder and CEO of Vanda Insights. Vandana, we're seeing reports out of China this morning that the Chinese export numbers are better than expected in August. Everybody wants their Christmas presents, and I think the Chinese are busy making them. Can we expect Chinese oil imports, do you think, to recover in the coming weeks and months? Hello, Sean, and good day, everyone. Uh, look, I think we discussed uh, China a fair bit uh, the last time I was on your show, and I think uh, the picture still remains a little bit hazy on, on China. I see both factors uh, that could pull oil demand down or oil demand growth down. And at the same time, I see, I mean, those are probably more mid to long term factors with regard to China. But in the short term, uh, I see uh, that as a supportive factor without doubt, because here we are actually comparing uh, essentially what China is uh, doing uh, with regard to restrictions, which is removing them and how the appetite is improving with regard to August. So compared with August, August, obviously, things are definitely looking up in China. But as I mentioned previously on your show, I think I do have very real concerns with regard to uh, the growth potential of Chinese economy. Uh, we see, um, and I, you know, we see reports almost every day on Chinese government's regulatory crackdown. It just doesn't seem to end, right? It, the tech industry, the steel industry, the education industry, the the entertainment industry. And at, over the weekend, we had a senior PBOC official talking about uh, regulation, the long arm of regulation now coming down in the financial services sector as well. So, you know, mid to long term, I'm, I would say, you know, moderate demand growth returning. But in the short term, of course, you know, compared to August, definitely the next few months in China, I think are going to look much better with regards to oil demand. Um, as you mentioned, yes, I think uh, the uh, festive season Christmas season should see a pickup in uh, uh, exports and demand for Chinese goods. I would say a caveat there is, of course, that, you know, provided there's no more uh, log jams at ports and supply chain issues, I think that will be an important criteria for Chinese exports to continue growing strongly in the coming months. Let's welcome back David Rundell, author of the book Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads. And of course, David, one of the, the longest serving U.S. diplomats in Saudi Arabia, but also a small oil operator in the Permian. And David, of those two hats, I want to start mm -hmm. with the uh, Texas patch, given the, the Ida hurricane last week and the the, the the sort of destruction that it has laid in its wake. I'd welcome an update there and what kind of impact that has been on the production and the legacy of recovery. Well, I think two things. Uh, you know, the, I, still there's a great deal of uh, production that's been shut in in, uh, in the Gulf. I think I read it was 80% still shut in this morning. Uh, that I think will come back. It's, uh, it's not that it was destroyed. It's just been shut in during the hurricane. That's fairly straightforward. That happens quite frequently. 
And usually uh, someone like the Saudis will step in and make up the shortfall in the short run, which is one of the roles that they have historically played uh, when something like this happens. Um, In terms of um, pricing, I think really the um, more important issues really are what's going to happen to interest rates with the central banks of which uh, many of them are reconsidering how they're going to do their, uh, whether inflation is is a serious problem for them now. Uh, I think that in addition to uh, interest rates, the question of the COVID, I think we're going to end up learning to live with COVID. I don't think we're going to see another uh, collapse of the oil market like we did before. I think the growth is going to come back. And I probably, and I think that the, Personally, I think that the interest rates are not going to get uh, pushed up dramatically in the short term. And then the final thing is the shale production. Uh, well, here you know, yeah, you 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 ask these questions. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I drilled a dry hole last week, so uh, that was not good news. Uh, but um, I'm drilling again this week, so uh, we're still, you know, we're not giving up. And uh, I think you'll see the point being that uh, the um, rig count is rising in the Permian Basin and people are, you know, optimistic. So I think that production will come back. I think that uh, the production in the Gulf will get turned back on. I don't think interest rates are going to rise dramatically and slow the economy. And I don't think that um, that uh, COVID is going to destroy us again. So where does all that leave us in the midterm? I would say, you know, somewhere in the 70s. I don't think well, we're going to get above it. It seems that we're, we're sort of in that in that sweet spot. That's where uh, I see it. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, and just to give you an idea, I mean, we're drilling today with the break even at something like fifty at, for the for the acreage that we're dealing with, and we figure if you know it's seventy, that's great. Uh, and it's so, a nice margin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's well, good, as the good. saying goes, "Drill, baby, drill." There's nothing that holds back the Texans. Meanwhile, <laughs> well, dry holes, dry holes. Well, dry uh, holes really won't good. keep your bankers happy, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> let's go back to uh, Peter in in, in uh, Sydney. Peter, I, I'm curious to get your perspective, and I know it's a particular view from Sydney. What's going on in China uh, exactly with all of these sort of new every week? There's a different sort of narrative. The most recent one, sort of clamping down on the on the uh, movie actors uh we had yesterday uh, your uh i think the position is called the treasurer of 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 uh of australia is that the finance secretary but ultimately senior treasury executive uh, official in australia saying that china's political pressure on australia's economy isn't working this war of words this sort of standoff between canberra and beijing goes on What's your take on all of that? Well, certainly, Sean, the the rhetoric has picked up over the last decade or so, and it wasn't a concern very much, I I don't believe, and certainly the 80s or the 90s, and it's probably the zero zeros. But in the last decade, yes, the the general, I I think since the GFC, we've seen a very solid interest from uh, from China across our uh, political landscape. We're also mindful of Victoria, which is the state under uh, Canberra, the capital, and the Belt and Road that they'd signed with uh, the Premier of the state, Premier Andrews, and that was torn up by the Prime Minister. So you can, you can sense the political uh, intrigue there. Also remembering that from an export-driven economy, Western Australia, due to iron ore and coal, we power China to a big percent, and there's really a lot of pressure, I think, on the big miners, how they play that game. So it's very much an argy-bargy. That's a typical Australian term between what we're doing and our treasurer's viewpoints and Beijing. And where, where I am in Sydney, we're about the ninth week or tenth week into a lockdown. So this is our longest, and I think there's a lot of um, concern domestically with our economy cratering uh, in, in small business, that is. And I think that's more the focus at the moment. Our, our lens is, whilst it might be on China, Sean, it's very much uh, a, a gaze internally to the 
the fragility of our domestic economy. And that really, well, some I think, acknowledgement. Is stage. Scott Morrison finally acknowledged during the week, the last few days, that the strategy of sort of zero COVID was flawed and now needing to ramp up vaccinations. Is that generally yeah. accepted or welcomed in Australia? I, I think... I, I think that's even a split bag between the haves or the, the, the vax and the anti-vax. I don't think people are necessarily anti-vax, but they're just, uh, it really hasn't engulfed our country. It hasn't taken over. And at the present time, there's a large percentage, certainly of young and, and middle-aged people that are saying in different parts, Queensland, for instance, has a very, very low uh, take up of the vaccination so, you know, there are different viewpoints all across the nation. This is an incredible country when you're thinking it's the size of Europe, as we all know, if not bigger, and you've got 25 or 26 million people. So it's just extraordinary. There's no one here. And that seems to be the... the, the, the I'm on my the way. Situation. I will take yeah. my... My five million acres. Um, no, You're we'll more go. than welcome. <laughs> yeah, we can't get in, but nonetheless. Vandana, um, looking at your headline on your Vanda Insights newsletter, uh, 3rd of September week, uh, crude confronts the economic headwinds in wake of Delta. I'm wondering from your point of view, that headline held quite prof- obviously quite uh, prescient on that particular week. Is that a sustained equation, do you think, or ultimately is crude and all markets throwing off the cloak of Delta? Yeah, so I was writing that views letter before the August US jobs data was out. And as we all know now, uh, that was a hugely disappointing figure. And and yes, looking back, I was glad I I focused on that because uh, in the short term, while we might think uh, and agree that crude prices are more or less in equilibrium in, let's say, Brent in around $72 with regard to fundamentals. I think uh, if we look at the next three to six months, it's really the the question, the challenge for the oil markets is how is the global economic recovery shaping up? And here, you know, I think there's almost a, a, a contrast between how the world was feeling, you know, whether you're talking about the financial markets in general, or whether you're talking about oil demand sentiment, how the world was feeling just before summer began. And as we got into the Northern Hemisphere summer season, you know, you'll recall, we talked about uh, huge bullishness in the markets and contrast it with now, the summer is past, perhaps a little bit abruptly truncated by the Delta wave. And, uh, looking at how, you know, dealing with the aftermath of the Delta wave. So the Delta wave in itself, I don't think is a major concern anymore, you know, with regard to, to psychological uh, factors in the oil market, you know, it's, it's sort of petering out. But, um, but you know, the, the aftermath of it, as I say, and, and as what I've highlighted in, in the views letter, and, and do take a look, um, I'm talking to the listeners, I know you have, yes. yeah, uh, yeah. is especially look at the two graphs I have over there with regards. So I've taken uh, China, the Eurozone and US, and I've taken data uh, on manufacturing PMI and services PMI. So the big debate now or, or the worry is that the manufacturing PMI, most of the, the developed world and emerging major emerging uh, market economies is still in expansion territory, all good. However, the growth is starting to, so it's in deceleration basically, because which was to be expected, right? The, the huge pent up demand for goods in the, uh, it just after COVID that's starting to die down. But the worry now for the economists, and I would say arguably the, the world is that the services sector and partly thanks to the Delta wave is not picking up. So it was if it was like pass the baton from manufacturing to services as the main driver of global economic recovery, that's not quite happening. And then, you know, obviously then that has spillover questions and implications for what it means for the jobs market, what it means for central banks, as you were just saying, you know, in terms of inflation, what it does to consumer sentiment. You know, we already see consumer sentiment around the globe starting to wobble as well. So, you know, if you look ahead for the for the oil market in terms of the wider financial uh, implications of the Delta wave, it's not looking too good. David, I wanted to get your uh, 
diplomat hat on uh, and, and just ask you your thoughts on the fallout from Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, September 1st, the US 20 year war with Afghanistan ended with quite a sort of, you know, some very un, 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 unpleasant uh, outcomes. Uh, but I'm wondering, from your perspective, uh, what are the ramifications? Are there any for the Gulf region of long established, strong relations? You know, the Gulf and Afghanistan have, you know, been interwoven for many, many years. I'm wondering your thoughts on the fallout from Afghanistan and where it goes from here. Well, I think that I would be premature in saying where, what that effect is going to be. I mean, it is. Um, I think we have to wait and see. Uh, clearly, what's happening in Afghanistan is uh, is manifest and obvious, but how that's going to affect the rest of the world, uh, I think we have to wait and see. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, it, clearly, it has demonstrated to many people a lack of commitment on the part of uh, the United States to some of its allies, whether or not that uh, emboldens some of our adversaries uh, remains to be seen. Uh, and one can only hope that it doesn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, the security that the United States provides is something like a bank. And if uh, everyone shows up at the bank and tries to take their money out on the same day, the bank will be unable to meet those demands. And that is the problem with the United States, if you will. The, uh, we don't like to think of it as the policeman of the world, but the sort of the, one of the stabilizing forces. And if all of a sudden many uh, demands are made, uh, it could be destabilizing. I, so that's a long answer, really, to say that it's too early to see what the Do you think that from, um, the middle, from the Gulf's but, perspective, that some states may well, look would, at that and think like that well what i think to be honest i, I don't want to I, I i think the real problem for the gulf at the moment is the iran israeli conflict if i were i'm i'm somewhat surprised that that's not being read into the um pricing uh and insurance rates um that's a very serious threat far more than whatever happens in afghanistan um both Israel and the Iranians um, are committed to their policies, which they view as existential. The Iranians uh, are committed to building a nuclear weapon. They have been working on it for years. They have endured serious sanctions uh, in economic hardship in order to continue that. Uh, they've built the delivery systems as well. Uh, and they view this as a defense mechanism. They see what happened to North Korea, and they see North Korea being treated with kid gloves and treated with great respect. And they see what happened to Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi, and they say, we don't want that to happen to us. They believe that the West, and particularly the United States, would like to see their regime changed. If you take that uh, so point they, on, they, the, on the regional sort of turmoil between Israel and Iran, the proxy uh, tit for tat we've seen in, in the last uh, two years or so. Uh, but yet it hasn't escalated beyond that, you know, attack on a boat, the, you know, the assassination of a nuclear scientist. In both cases, it does appear that there is restraint. Yeah, well, I think we're coming to the end of that because the Israelis believe that the um, Iranians are two months away from getting a nuclear weapon, and they believe that um, that's an existential threat to them. They believe that's something that they can't tolerate. So you've got one group that believes that uh, we got to get this bomb, and you've got another group that says if they do, uh, there's going to be a second Holocaust. And I'm not saying that they're going to have a war in the next couple of weeks, but I think that's something that I would be taking a lot more seriously than the markets seem to be looking at, because um, that, it, it, it's, they're, both, they're both viewing this very seriously. And if you ask the Israelis, you, I think you'll find that they have been trying with these various ship attacks and, and assassination plots and such things as that, that that's not stopping them. 
that the Iranians are continuing. I suppose well, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I suppose we're in a, a slightly vulnerable window where the perception might be that there is no appetite in Washington to take a challenge uh, of this nature. Uh, and maybe that might be misreading what they're willing or not willing to do at this time. But Peter, on to more tangible economic issues. You had the jobs number out of the US last week, uh, yeah. just on the headline alone, looked well below expectations. Deeper in the numbers, it looked like still sort of some strong indicators there. How do you interpret it vis-a-vis -vis where Fed and monetary policy goes from here? Well, building on, and that's exactly right, Sean, I'm building on Van Dana's point as far as those weaker, well, the stronger PMIs, but the I think the reality of the matter, which led us into a bit of a, a check up from the neck up was those Michigan numbers, the sentiment index, and that since 1978, it's been about 515 odd months of data, we had 1%, that, so it was the worst number uh, in that Six, in that 515 month period since 1978. So that's giving us an indication 13.4% down in July of the Michigan sentiment, con, consumer sentiment index. And that just demonstrates the fragility, which in turn wraps around your point as far as the underwhelming number that we had analysts, some were saying 900, 950,000. General consensus was about 740, 760,000, came in at about 250,000. So it was 500,000 shy on the NFP number Friday, which I think hit everyone between the eyes, just demonstrating that. And again, over a, you know, a, a summer period, you would have thought it could have been a bit stronger. So there's the first part. The second part, if I use this as a wake up call, we've just got the notes through from our RBA. They met this afternoon or your, your morning time in Dubai, Reserve Bank of Australia, and they're peddling back on taper from 5 billion to 4 billion a week but they've come out, Sean, and said that they won't uh, have a rate rise until at least 24. So there's the first part. And then they'll continue those purchases up until at least mid-February of next year. So if we're saying that the, that the Fed's going to offer a similar mindset to what our RBA is doing, it'll be a taper talk by end of year, how much they take off the table. And then who's the first one to jump? Well, it, seems, it seems like only a few weeks ago we were talking about our New Zealand going to increase rates by a quarter or a half a percent. That's and right. now it's like, are we even going to start tapering before the U.S. election cycle starts? And, well, and, and I think we have to bring into the thinking the possibility that there will actually be no taper uh, uh, if they don't jump through that window pretty soon. Let's yes. get the um, survey question uh, up uh, for everybody in the room. Uh, China's exports unexpectedly grew at a faster pace in August, thanks to solid global demand for Barbie dolls or whatever else. Do you expect China's oil imports to recover close to 2020 highs before the end of this year? Are we going to see a surge in China oil buying uh, before the end of this year? Lots of uh, strategic reserves uh, uh, have been depleted in China. Will they look to refill them even at $70 a barrel? Uh, Van, did I sort of lob that ball on your court? Uh, and, and if you want to follow up on what Peter was suggesting, where monetary policy goes, where the markets will follow. Yeah, thank you. I, I was listening quite uh, intently to Peter's remarks, especially on the RBA thinking of tapering, because, of course, the world's attention has been on the Fed and taper. But this Thursday, well, two days from now, we'll also be hearing from the ECB. And if you recall, I think it was last week that uh, the Eurozone inflation numbers come in, came in at the highest in a decade. And that started uh, making people wonder if the ECB will have to start tapering its bond purchases as well. So, you know, this is, a, this is not a, a Fed issue, clearly. It's something that the whole world is confronting. Oh. We already have a handful of uh, countries around the world that have already raised interest rates. And, you know, I take Peter's point that about that the, the banks are sort of reassuring the markets that, OK, we will taper our, our asset purchases, but we'll not be raising interest rates. That's what the Fed is doing as well. But we have Brazil, Mexico, Russia, Hungary, and South Korea. Um, these countries have already raised interest rates by, by, by a little bit, but nonetheless, they have. So, you know, just going back to the 
point I'd made earlier, uh, the banks will probably be reassuring, at least as far as the ECB is concerned and the Fed is concerned, but you know, the markets can't help but fret over how the banks are going to manage this, this balancing act. Um, on China, um, I answered no to that question. I think my views on this are, are pretty well um, articulated in your program, mm -hmm. uh, definitely and elsewhere. I know I do not expect Chinese oil demand to go back to 2020 levels. I think that was a bit of an exception, especially the first half of the year when the country was out of COVID more or less, much before the rest of the world. There was a lot of buying, a lot of buying appetite, especially by the independents. I don't think any of that is going to play out this year or for, for the foreseeable future. I do think, however, that uh, India and Indian oil demand recovery, and, and you have uh, something on your in your reading list on, on that as well. I think Indian oil demand recovery is a bright spot very much. Um, you know, the mobility in the country is, is back to almost to, well, at new post-COVID high levels. And uh, perhaps, again, getting very close to pre-COVID levels, the, the third dreaded third wave hasn't materialized so far, fingers crossed. It's interesting, the um, WHO chief scientist, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, said a few days ago that India might be reaching endemicity. So, you know, that was an interesting word for me, and endemicity uh, on the pandemic. And, and very quickly, I think it's also important to keep in mind that zero COVID strategy, and here in Singapore, we know how difficult it is to get away from it. Zero COVID strategy we have in China, we have in Japan, I think in Australia as well, right, Peter? Almost. Uh, New Zealand, South Korea, but we do not have it in, in India. So I personally am quite... Um, optimistic in terms of Indian oil demand to continue supporting uh, the oil complex in the coming months. And we have an October, November festive season coming up. Um, I think we'll see a steady pickup in, in Indian oil demand. Well, we're seeing uh, Indian equity, Indian equity markets hitting a record now every day. It seems they're, they're very much in that euphoric outlook mode. David, I wanted to get your thoughts since we had you on last. Of course, we had the OPEC plus agreement, disagreement between Saudi and the UAE. They resolved it. Uh, but I wanted to get your view on the sort of an overarching sense there. Is there indeed an emerging rivalry? We saw uh, the UAE announced this week some very big uh, economic aspirations to draw in foreign direct investment and, uh, uh, and other activities. The Saudis are firmly positioning on establishing the kingdom much more centrally in the global economy. Your thoughts on these two forces at work and what the, where that goes? Yeah, there are clearly, um, there are tensions between the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. There are tensions between all allies. There are always tensions between the United States and Saudi Arabia, tensions between the UK and Saudi Arabia. Uh, or the UK and the United States is what, um, what I should have said. Um, these are manageable when the underlying uh, reasons for the relationship uh, remain strong. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE remain uh, partners and remain uh, committed to stability in the Gulf region. Uh, they both view the stability and peace in this region as opposed to some other countries which are more revolutionary uh, you know, they, they like things the way they are. So um, these tensions uh, do exist. The Saudis are trying to become more of a, uh, would you, I, I think you said it, there's something of a regional center, which puts them in competition with uh, Dubai. They want to have more goods produced in their own country, which puts them at uh, conflict with uh, some imports from uh, free zones in the UAE. Um, and they both see, um, they're both increasing their oil production. Uh, I, that's a long-term issue, which I think that speaks pretty, that, that's an, an important factor that they, they both, uh, both see oil demand growing uh, for themselves in the long-term and are both expanding. So they're both gonna want to argue over uh, quotas in OPEC, but I don't think that is a, is a, uh, an end to their relationship or something uh, more dramatic. Um, if I, uh, you know, occasion, so that's my view on that. Yeah, uh, I think oh, they're going to have their attention. Yeah. Can I ask uh, you a quick question? What do you think of these uh, oil, high oil prices, not oil prices, gas prices, primarily energy prices in general in Europe, which seem to have reached a peak 
or a record of some kind recently. I, I'd sort of be curious to hear you, what you my took the words right colleagues. out of my mouth. I was going to go to Peter with that. And let's get the uh, survey result uh, and then go to Peter on that point. Obviously, uh, Asia, a massive gas importer, LNG market. Uh, we're seeing before the winter, obviously, Australia, a big LNG producer. Uh, we're see seeing these record gas prices uh what's your outlook for that the impact it may have positive or negative sure naturally it gets to a point in time that the consumer gets uh impacted in the in the purse and the wallet and we're experiencing that now certainly in australia as far as inflation and we're hearing the same sort of numbers coming out of of course eurozone with three percent as quoted and with what's happening across generally Asia and the US. So that's going to be the handbrake. How much can people bear to, from a pain perspective? I know that uh, I talk to India frequently and they're certainly uh, having all sorts of problems over there from a from a affordability aspect and then all of those inflationary issues coming off from higher energy prices. So that's the concern I think on Main Street and that's going to be a hurdle that is going to be a hard one to jump. Well, on the survey result, uh, we, we um, Irene's having problems posting it technically, but the result is that 58% said that they do expect to see Chinese oil per imports recover close to 2020 highs. So there is some counter position to what Vandana shared with us and her thoughts on that. But, uh, you know, how close is close, I suppose, inevitably is the thing. Uh, maybe higher than they were last quarter, but maybe not quite as high as they were last year. But on the gas market side, it's clearly some kind of cuckoo in a coal mine, I think, with the context of where the winter goes. Asia continues to struggle in building the infrastructure required to handle the LNG capacity that it needs, relying on floating regasification units in Bangladesh and Pakistan, uh, uh, and missed in some ways the opportunity to invest in that infrastructure a few years ago when prices of gas were way down. Uh, uh, so I think it's going to be very difficult uh, for Asia to, to catch up in the context of the infrastructure that they need uh, to sort of level out those prices. And, and we saw very high LNG prices in January this year. We're going to see them again. We're already seeing them. So it's going to be a painful winter for those who burn uh, burn gas for power. Uh, and uh, that's going to be another note just to wrap up uh, on elections. Obviously, we have the German election coming next mm -hmm. week. We've got the Canadian election, SNAP election. Uh, uh, where Trudeau is looking under water at the moment. Uh, Merkel's party is looking under water. Uh, and also in California, we have a recall election on the governor of California, which is, you know, the fifth, world's fifth largest economy. Uh, and uh, there is some challenge that the Democratic candidate there may uh, struggle in that. Uh, and you could perhaps uh, get a Republican into California, which would be an extraordinary outcome. But nonetheless, three elections to watch because they could have three of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, yeah. If they went one way or the other, it could affect a lot of policy making. So uh, worth keeping an eye on. But Vanden, as always, thank you very much. Just a quick note that Vanden is going to be our guest host on the Daily Energy Markets podcast uh, the week after next. So we look forward to that. Uh, and uh, yes, um, keep Peter on his toes. Uh, thank you, Peter from Sydney. And David, as always, great to have your thoughts and insights. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. We'll catch up every morning, 10.30 UAE time. All the best. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Cheers, Bye -bye, Sean. Now.